Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another ACE Spotlight presentation. My name is Ruzba Afrasiabi, and I will be your host. Today, we have Shahzad Hosseini, who is a data scientist at uh, Biosymmetrics. She will be talking about the application of machine learning in material science. With that, and without further ado, I hand things over to Shahzad. Hello, uh, everybody, and thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining me to discuss about machine learning in materials discovery. Um, I would like to ask all of you to take a moment and look at this picture and see what you're seeing. And guess what uh, is uh, what is it about and why? You may have seen this uh, picture. Um, back in November 2019 and thanks, US Thanksgiving. That's the supercharger station in California when the cars are lining up to just charge the batteries. I'm sure many of those drivers have wished for better batteries um, as many of us do. Um, Believe it or not, um, advances, many advances in many fields like aerospace, uh, energy, health, um, defense, uh, uh, microelectronics, um, uh, highly de depends uh, on an advance in materials. So most of the time, uh, materials are the solution to the problems in this field. And the traditional way of R&D and finding the new materials uh, are not capable of um, uh, this uh, pace of uh, advance. Um, if... Um, um, like in many other fields, material science also starts with a experimental fields starting like many centuries ago with empirical observations like um, Stone Age, Iron Age, and Bronze Age. A um, few centuries ago, with um, uh, scientists started to generalize and formulate the laws of physics um, into mathematical uh, equations. And that uh, results to a second paradigm, which is model-based theoretical science. And for example, in material science, laws of thermodynamics has helped this field to advance a lot. And a few decades ago, with um, advance in the computation power of the computers, many problems that can't be find uh, that can't be solved analytically has been. Uh, <laughs> computationally or um, compute has been solved computationally. For example, um, uh, density functional theories or molecular dynamics has helped material scientists to, um, to formulate real world uh, phenomenon and simulate them in a way that they couldn't have done with theoretical models. And few, uh, and like I would say it, almost two decades ago, this all um, data that has been accumulated through experiments, uh, model-based theoretical works and computation has resulted in a big amount of data that now with the emergence of machine learning and uh, um, big data, they can be uh, used as a way to expedite, uh, expedite the discovery of materials. This data include uh, materials property, physical, chemical properties, electronic, thermodynamic, mechanical, structural properties, um, or engineering or processing data like heat treatment or uh, image data like characterizations of materials or uh, spatial temporal data like tomography, structural ev uh, evolutions. And as many other fields, lots of unstructured text textual data coming from the uh, literature. Um, for those of you that might not be um, familiar with the field of material science, um, the big data in the real world materials uh, has many implications. Starting from uh, left to right, we could see that uh, most of the phenomena in material science can be explained through um, processing structures, properties, and performances. And this is basically a science relationship between the cause and effect. And materials informatics can generate um, predictive analytics that can predict the properties based on processing, composition, and structure um, features that we give to the model. Or it can move, we can move from right to left 
it, I mean, it's basically uh, using the goals and means that we have based on the um, like engineering goals that we have the, and the means that we can um, use as a processing uh, techniques to process the materials um, and go from that way. And in this way, we have basically an optimization design problem, which we are trying to maximize a property such that the structure follows some constraints. Um, materials informatic uh, can be used in three major um, area. One is screening for discovering new materials. Uh, second is learning new material science from large data sets. And third is applying machine learning to enable faster materials development. Uh, materials discovery bar screening and uh, data sets. Um, so like many other uh, um, fields, um, there are lots of data sets that can be screened to be, to, to be uh, searched for, for the application, a specific application that we are looking for. And, and based on what, explain, uh, what I explained about the accumulation of data through the experiments and um, theoretical models, now we have databases such as Materials Project or OQMD or uh, AFLOLIB that, that are large data um, bases of materials, including experiments, simulations, uh, which can help scientists from across the field uh, to screen them to find um, materials that they are looking for their specific applications. One of the works that has based on um, this type of screening data sets um, is uh, using this data set to find a computational design of a uh, coating for cathode for uh, lithium ion batteries in order to protect them against the side reaction in the batteries we need to coat them and uh, in one of the paper that i'm showing here um going through over 130k um compounds different oxygen bearing compounds they can be and they can uh, ha have been able to filter the data and come up to 1300 compounds and based on uh, then after that with using a multi-objective optimization and with weighted sum and rank aggregation they have come up with top 30 candidates for for the specific functionality that they were looking for which is here uh, protecting the cathode against the side reactions Another way that this um, huge amount of data or materials informatics can help is, is uh, helping to understand material science, basically. As you may uh, see in other fields, um, some of the trends can't be understood unless we have large amount of data. And this large amount of data not only can help us to understand that, uh, the material science itself, they can also help us to find out the accuracy of the techniques or methods that we are using. For example, um, there have been works that has used the, the experimental data um, to verify how, how is the accuracy of the calculation based on uh, DFT or density functional theories. Or uh, for example, using uh, high throughput computational screening of perscite materials for uh, a water splitting application. Um, in this specific paper, they, they have been able to uh, use uh, 5,000 different perscite application and new, uh, learn the new rules. Basically, um, um, instead of uh, we're simulating the formation uh, energy of one specific co compound. They have searched the whole map of the compounds, anything stable or um, semi-stable, and have been able to form this graph of materials that the edges shows the, uh, the, the relation between the, uh, the compounds and also the, the corners are <coughs> different elements. And it, this also includes more both stable and uh, semi-stable uh, materials. Another field that uh, materials informatics can help is using or accelerating uh, discovery of materials uh, based on machine learning. Um, like um, most of the machine learning can can be used to replace the expensive uh, ab initio or DFT calculation. 
and they are very um, uh, timely expensive calculation that machine learning with learning the new the rules uh, without even knowing that um, um, uh, without any expert or knowledge can help um, to accelerate this uh, and basically they are working um, as a surrogate model um, as well as um, aggregate properties of materials such as formation and enthalpy is given its atomic structure at rates several orders of magnitude magnitude faster than the methods that we are conventionally can use based on the um, pure computations mm -hmm. and that can expand the space of uh, uh, properties accessible to ma uh, atomic space um, scale modeling uh, one of the uh, papers that has used um, um, machine learning for for uh, accelerating the discovery is using the transfer learning. Most of the data sets that uh, are available in material science are coming from computations. And this computation are based on approximation. And that causes this, um, this computational data sets um, with lots of error compared to re real um, experimental materials so um so in this specific paper um authors has been able to use uh, the learning that they can do on a large data sets based on com um, computation and transfer it in a smaller data sets of materials from experimental conditions and basically learning the latent var variables there and applying that uh, to a real uh, experimental data and being able to use it as a way to uh, discover new materials for, for a specific application that they were looking for. Um, another a new emer uh, emerging field in materials discovery is through capturing the latent knowledge. And that's a great paper um, that has used the, the knowledge in the literature uh, through pure NLP work, natural language processing work, to be able to find out the materials that could have been discovered many years bef um, before that they have actually discovered. So they have they have gone through the, the, the literature and found that there are compounds that has later been discovered for a specific application or having a specific property while they could have been discovered much more uh, earlier if we had the knowledge that we ha have now based on the literature. There are paths with literature, basically. I'm not going to talk about this one um, more than that because um, we are going to have a great talk on this uh, paper. And um, one other way that uh, machine learning is helping the materials discovery is um, using the semi-supervised or um, um, natural language processing techniques to come up with the synthesis met method for materials. Basically, in this uh, paper, they have just used um, um, topic models to find out different topics of material based on this experimental sections of the papers. And they have used Markov chain to come up with the steps that scientists could take to go from um beginning step one to a to z to to be able to synthesize a specific material and that's uh that's really helpful in um summarizing what uh can be found in, in literature and also uh, making it into a accessible knowledge that can be used for future Shahzad, if i can interrupt you for a second sure. uh, we have a question online they're asking um if that the time computational complexity of the modeling using ML is better than DFT. I believe they're asking if um, if, if uh, ML models can do better than the DFT in regards to uh, the processing time and uh, the processing power required. Yes, I, I think I, I mentioned in uh, in the slide that I was talking about the um, the computational um, so like uh, in this slide, I guess, uh, which 
which machine learning helps us to understand the, the techniques that we are using. So basically using the machine learning techniques, we can, we can go through the experimental data and see the accuracy of the DFT models. And sometimes machine learning can, uh, can do the, the job of the DFT calculation All just by, by learning the, the rules uh, without um, like expending too much time on doing the DFT calculation. Yeah, it's very correctly said. Um, DFT calculation are very time consuming computations basically yeah so so like based on what i understand dft calculations usually uh take much more time because um they they consider all states um or all conditions um but uh, ml methods uh would usually skip some of these uh, steps uh, based on what i understand is that correct um uh, yes uh, that that's correct and also um uh, with dft calculation um uh, basically the computation is doing the whole process of the like the phys physical or quantum mechanical solving of uh, schrodinger uh, uh, equation basically but with machine learning if it, it can just learn the rules that um causing like from going the features to 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 the answers that we are looking for based on the calculation that has already been done and we don't really need to 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 repeat it for a, a larger space that we need we, we can do it in a smaller space as as you correctly said so based on what you just described are you, are you, are you saying that uh, the machine learning methods would learn from the data from dft Basically, they are yes, they are contributing to each other. Both machine, so we can use we are using DFT calculation to do machine learning modelings uh, to predict the uh, um, properties or whatever we want. Uh, so we are using the features that we are getting from DFT as an input to to machine learning, and we can also use machine learning as a surrogate model to do the DFT for us to 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 get the information that we are learning. Basically, learning the physical rules that. That, like, for example, gives us the band gap of uh, um, semiconductors. Okay, that answers, uh, I think, all our questions. Uh, thank you so much. No problem. Uh, yes, and uh, another way of... Um, Natural language processing helping the material discovery, as I said, is uh, finding the like basically um, experimental procedures that are um, that are hidden in the literature and finding them, giving a step by step direction to for to a scientist to be able to use it to synthesize materials in in lab. Um, there are um, although um, as I said. Um, most of the data sets, the big data sets that we have in material science are coming from computations, which inherently had some error because of the whole big uh, approximation that we are using to do that computations. So, um, and the experimental data is not that huge, not that we haven't done experiments uh, through the centuries, that the only th reason is that most of the time in literature, scientists just report the the final successful product, not the whole failures that they have to come up to that. So we are we are um, we don't have the whole data sets of uh, information that we can use uh, as an input for machine learning. So deep learning works are are not as prevalent as uh, it should be in materials discovery, and that's more. Um, important, for example, in, in organic materials. With in organic materials, we have lots of constraints in terms of structures and crystallinity or things like that. With um, molecular uh, materials, like for drug discovery, deep learning um, has, has been uh, more uh, um, common way of uh, discovering new materials for, for basically molecule, molecules that, uh, that can have application in uh, drug discoveries. But one of the, the papers that has used uh, like deep learning techniques to um, learn from the elements, go to the properties and find basically, it has been able to find um, like um, uh, binary or ternary, ternary compounds. And they have been able uh, to list <clears throat> 
a list of uh, compounds um, of which they basically th uh, think that they have the proper, like for example, for uh, in this specific paper, they have been able to find properties for a uh, band gap. And uh, uh, with that, uh, or uh, for um, photovoltaic uh, applications, and they have listed them in in this paper. For and uh, these 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 um, lists of new uh, discoveries or materials that can be discovered uh, need to be uh, checked experimentally there and um, um, to to be report that if they are really correct and they they can be considered as a new discovery. But they they are works that are using deep learning for uh, material discovery as well. And uh, with that, I would like to give two main takeaways uh, that I would like to have. Um, and that's materials informa uh, informatics uh, is becoming common and critically important for material scientists uh, with the speed of materials discovery. And um, the part that I uh, presented today was just about materials discovery, but uh, machine learning techniques are playing very great and important role in characterization of materials, which is Again, another story that requires another talk for itself. But, um, and more structured and machine accessible data sets uh, can help this field to better take the advantage of the progress uh, and state of the art techniques that we have in uh, machine learning and deep learning, basically. Um, with that, I would like to thank you, everybody. And I'm happy to take the question if there are any. Thank you, Shahzad. Uh, one of the questions that we had um, is, uh, what is the exact application of ML for AB in issue calculations? Um, so it has, as I said, uh, it has two, it's it's same, basically same as DFT calculation. It has two ways, F starting from, so we use um, the output of uh, ab initio calculations um, as an input for machine learning um, models to be able to predict, for example, property, and uh, like going from um, ele electronic structure, like band gap of, um, semiconductor being able to to predict the 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 color or the wavelength of the um, the and also in, including the process because we are also including the information that we have from processing the material structure of the material to be able to predict um the color of the wavelength that a specific semiconductor can emit um and it's going to be different from the band gap uh, itself, because we, now we have a material with a structure, with a process that has affected that. That's one part. So, and uh, that's that. And secondly, as I said, for for some calculation, ab initio calculations are very costly. Uh, so, um, sometimes machine learning can can help to learn that um, that rules and do the um, the like basically give us the output of the app and issue uh, calculation basically as a surrogate model learning the rules and just giving the outputs like for example um, uh, fit the example of the band gap that i said like giving the electronic structure of the material uh, getting the band gap the theoretical band gap of the materials compounds basically Okay, so let me just check if there are any questions. Um, don't have any questions on YouTube. I just had a general question. Um, where do you think um, ML is in material science right now? Have we reached a point where, where we have created materials using uh, machine learning uh, methods um, that have reached a point where they're products? Uh, yes. Uh, so. It depends. If if you're looking for very cutting edge technique of uh, like machine learning to be used in material science, it's not as prevalent as other fields. Um, as I said, is because of this um, the data sets that we have. But um, I am seeing many companies are uh, emerging around the product that 
uh, doing a um, couple of things. First, they are trying to give, um, like for materials producer or synth like material synthesizer, like for example, in my postdoc, I, I was working with a company that was uh, producing materials for battery application. And we were, we were using machine learning techniques to give them the suggestions of the materials that we were thinking that could be a good candidate. So we have that. We also have companies that are going to like doing a consulting projects for, for other companies. So basically we, um, giving, uh, they are saying to the companies, you don't need to, to go hold through the whole data sets of uh, experiments and do all of them uh, to be able to get the, the specific property that you want. For example, fatigue property in the steel, we can predict that if you use this composition of the uh, carbon, iron, whatever, uh, alloying elements, plus this processing technique, you would approximately have that property. So you don't need to search for the uh, wider range of the um, uh, space. That's that one. And another way that um, I'm seeing that company, that's basically a company in Toronto that's helping the materials company, and that's for predictive maintenance. So based on the data that you have and the materials that you're producing, we can predict that now you're, for example, um, um, film uh, deposition machine needs repair or at this schedule will need repair this type of things that are emerging from that, which are very um, uh, applicable in, into the field. So the, 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 the example that you just gave, is this based on having sensors connected to, let's say, a machine? Yes, and then, yes, okay, yes. Okay, interesting. Um, we have two, mo two more questions uh, sure. from the uh, online audience. Uh, first one is, uh, how does the interaction of formal calculations, example DFT, and uh, the ML techniques work? Um, do they exchange data or rules, et cetera? Um, for, for for DFT to machine learning, yes, um, output of DFT can be used as a data set for machine learning, and uh, uh, and for for helping DFT calculation with machine learning, yes, we, machine learning just learns the rules from the DFT calculation without really knowing the really um, the physical rules that are governing that um, specific property but uh, basically learning that from um, from the data and uh, being able to help the DFT in much more faster um, calculations um, thank you so the second question that we have is uh, what data sets uh, do we have access to I uh, want to hear a little about them how big uh, are are they? Uh, are they updated? Uh, how good are they? So on and so forth. So in uh, that couple of uh, databases that I mentioned here, uh, materials project or uh, open quantum materials database, they are really big data um, databases, um, which include experiment and calculation. Most of them are calculations um, because um, just recently people are trying to you to enter like digitize the uh, experimental work, but most of the calculate computational works, molecular dynamics or DFT calculation works um, has been um, very well documented in these databases. Um, so you could basically start from elements going to uh, properties like what would be the shear modulus of um, like this um, element or like whatever. And based on that, um, you could enter your uh, own processing data and be able to use machine learning techniques to, to predict the properties that you want or performance based on that. OK, I, we have um, another question in continuation of sure. uh, the previous question. They're saying, how does um, they're talking about uh, the usage of uh, DFT and ML. They're asking, how does that help uh, the DFT calculations? Uh, is the goal of uh, using ML uh, to replace DFT, or is the goal to accelerate it? Accelerate it um, in most of the cases, um, because um, uh, if we, as I said, like DFT calculations are very computationally demanding. Uh, uh, 
processes. That's why uh, um, we are using machine learning to, to be able to accelerate those processes. So they're not going to be able to... So no, they, they are not going to uh, replace, replace it. Replace, okay, yeah. okay. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions uh, that we had online. With that, I would like to thank you so much uh, for uh, giving this talk. Uh, I would like to also uh, remind the audience that uh, we have another presentation at noon. Um, the title of the presentation is Model Selection for Optimal Prediction and Statistical uh, Learning. So with that, I would like to thank uh, Shahzad and the audience, um, and I hope everybody a good day. Thank you so much.